I realized that um, that time he was living in New York. And I, I said, wait a second, where are you? He said, New York. And I said, it's 3.30 in the morning. And he goes, yeah, I'm going running. Okay, of course. <laughs> and I realized at that point, I was like, okay, you know, there's, it's, it's undisputable. You right. know, this guy lives the persona that he projects into the world. Mm. The night before we had this event, uh, he came out to the lab. My lab, we do, we study fear, we study courage, we study resilience, and we study the underlying neurochemical um, substrates for those. So we had a bunch of guys there, a couple team guys, um, some other folks, and we bring them in this little room and we do virtual reality there. And one of the things that we use to scare people um, or to generate a sense of autonomic arousal is this uh, experience of diving with great white sharks, which of course you're not in water in the laboratory, but it's very immersive. And for people that are afraid of sharks, it, it can be um, quite scary. Not always, but um, we also have heights, we have claustrophobia, we got something where you can feel spiders crawling all over your body if you're uh -huh. an arachnophobe. We, <laughs> you know, if you have a pain point, we find it. Do you so, spend time trying to figure out what that pain point is? We do, and we do it through some very uh, covert uh, <laughs> yeah. methodology right. that involves AI and some some uh -huh. fun tools. Um, a bunch of weird questions that, we're, right, all right. We're, we're, let's just say this, from the moment you step into our laboratory, uh -huh. we're, we're studying you. So the, um, uh, and, now I know. And yeah, exactly. So uh, what was fun was, you know, so I sort of explained what the platform was and what we were gonna do. And, um, and David said, uh, he goes, I don't like sharks. And I, I was like, all right, well. <laughs> and so then, you know, this was not a, a typical experimental day in the lab. So I just kind of, at one point I finished describing what the tech is and how we're gonna wire people in. And then I said, so, um, so who wants to go first? And he's like, I'll go. Right, of course. And, and what yeah. was funny to me at that moment, I realized this is interesting because he, he was very explicit about the fact that he didn't like sharks. He was very explicit about the fact that he was going to be first, you know, first man in. I mean, I, it would be inappropriate for me to describe his data, right? And we didn't do a full blown experiment. But what I can say is he's, whatever it is that David has figured out how to do, it clearly involves taking whatever adrenaline pulse he feels and understanding something fundamental to biology, which is that adrenaline response was designed to move us, not to keep us stationary. He uses behavior as the way to shift sensation, perception, feelings, and thoughts. He understands how to run that program in the right direction. Whereas most people, when they don't like what they feel, they start negotiating sensation, which will never work. They start trying to control their perception, which is hard, right? They're like, oh, I'm not gonna think about that or I'll think about it differently. Very hard to control the mind with the mind. He knows that's a tough one. Yeah. Feelings, Lord knows what those are and how to control them. I mean, we'll eventually figure that out as a field, but thoughts are complicated. So he just goes immediately he to goes action. He goes Immediately right to towards action. It. So when he says, just for clarity, when he says, I don't like sharks, he's basically saying, put me in the shark tank. Like he's cueing you to say, this is the thing I'm afraid of and I'm gonna be the first one to volunteer and I know you're gonna put me in the shark tank right. if I tell you that. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, and I obviously can't speak for him, but uh, one of the things I think is very clear is that he's tapped into this neuroplasticity process through the, the door, through the portal of agitation and stress. He's figured out, th and this is really the holy grail of neuroscience, is how can I modify my brain? Well, you modify it by placing yourself into discomfort and using that as a pro propeller to move you into action. And you know, a couple years later when David was uh, working on his book and I heard the book was coming out, I think I saw a pre-release announcement, uh, I texted him and I just said, look, I'm really excited to see your book. I'm, I'm, uh -huh. and, and he said, oh, that, that, great, thank you. You know, it'd uh, be great if you'd um, write something about it, like a, an endorsement. I said, oh, I'd be honored to, I'm happy to. And he said, but but I need it tonight. Right. And uh -huh. this was Saturday at, I think it was like 10.30 at night when I texted him. So um, I said, great, well, like, I'd be happy to, I won't do it now. He said, I need it by midnight. So I sit down, I start writing this thing. And these are short blurbs, but I kind of realized that, you know, you want to get it right. It's yeah. David and, you know, my name's next to it and I want to do, do it justice. So I'm sitting down, I'm working on this thing and I text him, look, I'm gonna be a few minutes late, no problem, no problem. Finally, I send him the thing at like 12.30 at night. And he's like, oh, bro, thank you, thank you, thank you. I promise I'll send you a copy of this and that. And I was like, grateful, you know, thank you. And then I, I realized that um, that time he was living in New York. And I, I said, wait a second, where are you? He said, New York. And I said, it's 3.30 in the morning. And he goes, yeah, I'm going running. Okay, of course. <laughs> and I realized at that point, I was like, okay, you know, there's, it's, it's undisputable. You right. know, this guy lives the persona that he projects into the world. Mm. And even that day, that consultant.
marathon gig, you know, there was a four o'clock lag and he was like, no, let's keep going. So he's figured something out. And I think that his um, enormous popularity um, is it's earned because he's figured out that it really doesn't matter if you come at something from a place of joy and love and a, that would be wonderful. But there's a whole other set of ways to approach this that involve slogging through the discomfort, the doubts, the wish for things to be different and starting with behavior. Yeah. And it's incredible because if you think about sensation, perception, feeling, thought, and behavior, actually the way to control our nervous system and feel the way we want to feel is to run that backwards. Behavior, thoughts. So if you change your behavior, then generally your thoughts, your feelings, and your perceptions change. Yeah. And everyone tries to come at it from the other end, but he's figured out through whatever process led him there and incredible life circumstances, how to run it in this direction of behavior first. Yeah. And I really think that if neuroscience has anything to offer, it's some understanding of what the underlying chemicals and neural circuits are, but the sooner that the human animal, the human species can start to understand that our, our feelings and our thoughts and our memories and our, all that is very complicated, but that when behaviors are very concrete and they are the, the control panel for the rest of it. I don't wanna relegate feelings. Feelings are extremely important. I don't wanna relegate perception. They're extremely important. But when it comes to wanting to shift the way that you function to get better or to perform better or to show up better, or to move away from things like addictive behaviors. It's absolutely foolish for any of us, me included, to think that we can do that by changing our thoughts first. It's behavior first, thoughts, feelings, and perceptions follow. It works every time because the, the brain circuits, meaning sets of connections and chemicals, they're there from birth, they're there your whole life, and they were designed for that. So in 2018, a graduate student in my lab published a paper in Nature showing that in the face of a physical threat, there are three options. You can obviously freeze, you can retreat, or you can move forward. And the moving forward response actually triggers activation of a connection in the brain to the dopamine circuitry of the brain and makes it more likely that you're gonna be able to move forward in the future. Now, what was interesting to us was that not only is forward action rewarded at a neurochemical level, which then sets you up for more forward action, but the highest level of agitation and stress was associated with moving forward. We always think, well, if I just calm myself enough, I'll be able to move forward. Right. But it's the exact opposite, <laughs> yeah. you know? And so people who are paralyzed in fear or that have a hard time initiating, sometimes the key is to raise the level of stress and agitation. This is why deadlines are so effective. Right. This is why fear is so effective. This is why that deer gets up out of its, you know, mm. nice little den and starts to move because it feels a certain level of agitation. If that agitation isn't high enough, we will not move forward. And so especially in the US, you know, we have a culture in which stress has been created. You know, these ideas around stress are that, is that it's terrible for us, when in fact stress is designed to move us forward towards these action steps that are rewarded, which then move us forward and so on.